Hey everyone, David Chen here. No Time to Die is finally out in US theaters this weekend. It's Carrie Joji Fukunaga's take on the James Bond franchise. It's also Daniel Craig's last run as James Bond. Let's talk about it. Now, before we get going, I do want to warn you, I am going to spoil the movie in this review, and there's going to be some pretty massive spoilers. So if you do not want to know what happens in No Time to Die, you pause this video, go watch the movie, come back, save it for later, or don't complain that I spoiled the movie because I'm about to drop some major, huge spoilers, okay? So... Let's get going. No Time to Die has a lot that it wants to accomplish. It wants to modernize the character of James Bond. It wants to wrap up the plot arc that began with Casino Royale. And it needs to also serve as a fitting swan song for Daniel Craig, ideally. And I have to say that overall, it accomplishes some of those things, most of those things you could even say. I had a good time with the movie as I was watching it, but as I've had more time to sit and reflect on it, it's kind of started to sour a little bit for me. And I wanted to make this review to explain why I feel kind of mixed about this entry into the James Bond franchise. First, let's start with what's awesome about the movie. I think that the movie looks amazing. Kari Joji Fukunaga knows how to direct action. You got Linus Sangren doing cinematography. It's gorgeous. It might not quite be Roger Deakins level, but it's pretty close. And there are some sequences that are just absolutely beautiful in this movie uh, and the set pieces are really thrilling there's some top tier James Bond action throughout the film and I think that overall if you come here looking for some good action you're gonna have a good time the cast is also amazing Anna de Armas shows up and the movie roars to life when she's in the movie uh, she is awesome and a sorely missed presence when she basically vanishes from the film uh, after her like 20 minutes that she spends in the movie you also have new characters like Lashana Lynch who is extremely charismatic and I really wish we got to spend more time with her as well and you have old mainstays like Ben Whishaw, Naomi Harris, Ray Fiennes. All these actors, I think, are really comfortable in these roles at this point. Even though they don't get that much to do in this movie, with the exception of maybe Ray Fiennes' M, it's really fun to watch these characters bounce off each other because at this point they've played these characters multiple times and they have good chemistry. But the more I think about it, the more I feel like this movie really has some pretty big issues that I can't ignore. Uh, the first one is pacing. The movie is over two hours and 40 minutes long and you really feel it. There's some movies you watch where it coasts through that runtime and you're enthralled the entire time. This one, it definitely started to drag. I thought the first hour, hour and a half of this movie was amazing. Just like, I was so into the movie. I was like, this could be the best James Bond movie of all time. Like I was having such an amazing time watching all these new characters get introduced, the amazing action, the amazing cinematography. I was like, this is, this is great. This is why I love movies. And then the movie kind of just grinds to a halt for its conclusion. When a movie like this changes gears like this, when it like loads in a ton of exposition and introduces a new character and all these plot machinations, it really needs to make it so that uh, the second half feels like it's building up to this big conclusion, this big satisfying development. And I don't think that what happens in the second half really is that interesting. Which brings me to my main problem with No Time to Die and the entire Daniel Craig run altogether. They really tried to do a bunch of things different for No Time to Die. They tried to do a bunch of things different for the Daniel Craig run of James Bond. Uh, the biggest thing, obviously, is serialization, right? The story theoretically continues from one movie to another. That had never really happened in previous James Bond movies before. And they really tried to make something that had an arc where if you look at the totality of the Daniel Craig movies, you feel like, oh, that's a satisfying story told from, you know, the beginning, middle and end. And of course, I don't think it really succeeds because the producers of this movie, they're not really used to making movies that have an arc like this. They're not the MCU. They're not even like DC. They don't really have that skill set. And of course, the directors and the writers working on this, they don't necessarily necessarily know the full outline when they're making their entries in the films. So what ends up happening is you have something really disjointed and it doesn't feel uh, like it's fully formed, fully baked. Uh, this is nowhere more clear than in a movie like Spectre, which felt like they just slapped in this explanation of Blofeld is the author of all of James Bond pain and they didn't do anything to explain anything about it. It makes absolutely no sense in my opinion. Uh, the storytelling just feels really all over the place. My opinion of Daniel Craig's run as James Bond is that none of it has ever fully lived up to the promise of Casino Royale, unfortunately. Casino Royale was such a breath of fresh air, Martin Campbell showed us a new version of James Bond, a James Bond that didn't really crack wise, that was extremely physical with how he fought and engaged with opponents, uh, that was weary and that had feelings that was vulnerable. These are characteristics of Bond that we haven't really seen in the past. We've seen like glimpses of it and like Connery's Bond and stuff like that. But a lot of people, I think when they think of Bond, they think of 
uh, Roger Moore's era of Bond, which was honestly very cheesy. You know, you got these over-the-top one-liners, over-the-top gadgets, over-the-top villains. And Casino Royale said, hey, uh, that stuff's in the past. There's a different way. There's a better way. And look, we got the perfect guy to embody this new vision of what James Bond can be in the modern era. The unfortunate thing is that every single film since Casino Royale has taken a step backwards towards the Bond that we knew before Daniel Craig. It's taken a step towards camp. It's taken a step towards being over the top and silly. In Casino Royale, Daniel Craig is asked the question, shaken, not stirred, and he says, do I look like I give a damn? In every subsequent movie, he does all the stuff that James Bond does. He says the Bond, James Bond line. He says the shaken, not stirred. He says all the stuff. Daniel Craig's run as James Bond has been caught between two worlds. It wants to be a dark, gritty reimagining of James Bond, like Batman Begins style, like Jason Bourne style, but it also wants to satisfy Bond fans by delivering the things that Bond fans have come to know over the last five to six decades. And those things are kind of inherently silly. One-liners, womanizing, uh, villains with wild plans and physical deformities. And the thing is, those things in our modern world look really, really outdated and very silly. This tension is really, really evident with No Time to Die, the first half of which is extremely thrilling, fairly grounded, down to earth, horrifying with this home invasion opening that I've never seen in a Bond film before. And then by the second half, it just shifts to classic Bond. You got Safin, who's played by Rami Malek. He does fine, but he's just this classic villain we've seen many times before. His face is all messed up, like we've seen many Bond villains before. And it just feels very outdated. You know, it doesn't feel modern. It doesn't feel fresh because we've just seen this guy. It's just a Dr. Evil guy. It's a Dr. Evil thing. We've already seen it not only a dozen times, but we've seen it parodied several times before. And as a result, it just feels like this movie, along with the rest of Daniel Craig's run as Bond, doesn't know what it wants to be. Another area of this film where you can feel this tension is with Lashana Lynch's portrayal as the new 007. Now, overall, I think that she and Daniel Craig have like this wonderful banter and this tension about who's going to be the new 007 and oh isn't it funny that Lashana Lynch is new 007 and she's kind of like better than this other guy. The big problem with the movie is it doesn't know what to do with her character. Uh, she doesn't really get that much time for us to really learn more about her nor does she get that many hero action moments. And that was a huge disappointment. When I first saw her, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Uh, the James Bond franchise is doing something super progressive, passing on the mantle of 007 to a black woman. And then it doesn't really follow through on it. And then there's this very awkward scene at the end where she's like, I want Daniel Craig to be 007 because the movie wants Daniel Craig to die as 007 and James Bond to die as 007. But it just is this really weird moment that feels completely unearned by what happened before. Um, so it's kind of a bummer. And that's kind of part and parcel with this whole movie is basically Basically, like it has these ideas of like here's ways we can move into the 21st century never really follows through with them but the movie does have a really shocking solution to all this which is to kill James Bond for the very first time there is no question about it James Bond is dead you saw him die you saw the missiles come down onto the island and explode while he was there uh, he did not make it off that island alive Daniel Craig's head didn't pop up at the end it's over for James Bond or so it seems. I've been thinking a lot about how so much stuff has happened since Spectre, the last Daniel Craig James Bond movie was released. Like think of all the stuff that's happened in the world. Uh, you had the entire Donald Trump administration. You had the pandemic, the Me Too movement, George Floyd, racial justice protests. All these things have happened. But James Bond hasn't changed that much. Now, again, because of Casino Royale, he was a little bit rebooted. He was a little bit uh, kind of in a new mode. And so he was less out of touch than a Pierce Brosnan James Bond would have been. I recently watched uh, The World Is Not Enough, which is a great James Bond movie, great classic James Bond movie. It has all the stuff that people want when they see a James Bond movie. I have to get it back or somebody's gonna have my butt. First things first. But it also feels ridiculously out of date, right? All the one-liners are super cringy. The sexual harassment is appalling. And the villain's plan feels really ridiculous. There is no way that that version of James Bond could have survived until today, at least not without absorbing a bunch of negativity and box office losses. The Way No Time to Die ends is a statement. It's a statement from the producers, the filmmakers saying, this era of James Bond is definitively over. Whatever comes next, whoever is gonna play James Bond next, it's gonna have to be a different concept of James Bond. At least that's what I think. I don't know what they're gonna do. I don't know if they're gonna get a different actor to play James Bond who's like a person of color, if they're gonna get a woman to play James Bond, if they're gonna completely rethink the idea of James Bond from the ground up. Uh, it's hard to proceed because you want 
James Bond to evolve. But if he evolves, then you're fundamentally doing violence to the idea of what James Bond is in the first place, right? Like, is he James Bond if he's no longer womanizing? Is he James Bond if he's no longer doing whatever the F he wants? Is he James Bond if he's not fighting a villain that's trying to take over the world or kill millions of people? Like, what, what is he then? Like, what, what's the purpose of continuing to use that name other than just name recognition? It's a really tough task that the producers, the caretakers of this franchise have in front of them. But I do think it's the right move what they did here. It's the right move to say we're moving on with this version of James Bond, not just Daniel Craig as James Bond, but I think this whole idea of James Bond that we've had until now. That's what I interpret the ending of this movie to be. Can the concept of James Bond survive in our world? Not without making some drastic changes. And Daniel Craig's version of Bond tried to do just that. It took three steps forward and then two steps back. And you see those two steps back in the final half of No Time to Die with Safin and all that stuff. Like that's just classic. Classic James Bond stuff. So I am really fascinated by what's going to happen next to this franchise, where they're going to take it next. I think no matter what, it's going to be interesting. Daniel Craig's run has been interesting. You know, like I haven't loved every movie. In fact, I haven't liked most of them, but they've made some big swings and there's been some amazing moments in the franchise uh, that are great for trailers and that we'll see for many, many years to come. I've been watching James Bond since I was a kid and he's been a big part of my development and upbringing as a movie watcher and a movie reviewer. So I'm gonna be game for this franchise no matter where it goes. But I am really curious, what did you think of No Time to Die? Did you think it was a satisfying entry to the Bond franchise? Do you agree with what I had to say about modernizing Bond? And what do you think of the fact that they killed James Bond? Let me know in the comments and be sure to hit like or subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Hit that bell icon. You can get notifications when I go live or make a new video. That's it for me. No time to die. A mixed bag. But I'm glad I saw it. And it's an interesting take on the Bond franchise. R.I.P. Daniel Craig as Bond. Thanks to all of my patrons at patreon.com slash Dave Chen for supporting my YouTube channel, supporting my podcast, supporting what I do, and getting some bonus content in the meantime. If you want to support me, patreon.com slash Dave Chen. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.